ancient Romans, the architects of aqueducts, the godfathers of fine wine, the preeminent of language, law, and literature, and legends of love? Rome was a society with one set of rules for men of nobility and another set of rules for everybody else. Freeborn Roman men could revel in sexual freedom with whoever they pleased, irrespective of their marital status. As a result, raucous festivals, sterile marriages, extramarital affairs, and abusive relationships were rife across Rome's patrician class. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we look at all things love and marriage in ancient Rome. A recurring theme of Rome's treatment of love, lovemaking, and marriage is Rome's high society taking their pickings from the lowest rung of the ladder. As grim as it sounds, it was often slaves and the freed that the patricians would satisfy their lust with. The entertainers of the day, the gladiators of Rome's famed Colosseums, were some of the most desired among the wives of the nobility. It was not uncommon for discreet arrangements to be made for Rome's highest standing women to sleep with the gladiators. Well, the ones that survived. Without a doubt, the most infamous case of gladiators being entertainers outside of the Colosseum belongs to Emperor Marcus Aurelius. His wife, Faustina, was supposedly left entranced and rather thirsty from watching gladiatorial displays. Marcus Aurelius spoke to soothsayers as to how to address his wife's unbridled lust. The soothsayers had a radical course of action that was promptly followed. On the advice of the oracle, Faustina not only had relations with the gladiator she desired, but the gladiator was executed while on top of her. She was then to bathe, literally bathe, in the blood of this slain gladiator to satiate and quell her lust. Oh, then just for good measure, she was then to make love to Marcus Aurelius the moment after. I don't know who had it worse, Faustina, the gladiator, or the poor souls who had to clean up afterwards. Love and marriage. Go together like a horse and carriage. Unless you're in ancient Rome. Despite such sexual prominence in society, marriage, on the other hand, was an entirely functional institute. In the eyes of Roman society, marriage was purely a union to join and strengthen estates and to make children. The result of this was that marital sex, in a romantic form, sexual gratification between partners, was a rarity, if not an oddity. Accounts of marital sex in Rome are not lust-filled tales of heightened pleasure, they are practically mathematic. Women were expected to be pliant to their husband's penetration and only be in pursuit of childbearing. Family Guy High Class British Porn Skid Anyone? As tasteless or alarming as this may sound to many, the political position of a wife in Rome played out into further restricting ways. Any extramarital affairs of husbands were not to take any complaint from the wife in question. Her sexuality was on hold, he was free to roam. However, should a wife be found guilty of infidelity, punishment by law was the most likely outcome. Roman literature depicts wronged husbands castrating and beating their wives' lovers in defense of their honor. So could a thoroughly cheated upon Roman woman divorce her husband? Apparently so. In a very ambivalent take on sexuality, adultery for men was accepted, and adultery was also a perfectly suitable reason for divorce. Furthermore, divorce in Roman society did not hold the traditional stigma that modern times have shown. A divorce was free to happen in Rome. Though to be sure, if there was one outcome a woman in Rome wanted to avoid, it was becoming a widow. Not only would you have to grieve a husband likely cheating left, right, and center, following ten months after his passing, you'd be expected to marry again. Love marriage and lovemaking did have liberalistic freedom in ancient Rome, for, for men. In a society entirely empowering men and leaving women with scraps and defined roles, sexual fluidity in the eyes of this society was a one-way street. Roman men were free to have relations and relationships with fellow men, but there were some do's and don'ts. Without taking a hit on one's social standing, open relationships with the same sex required the freeborn man to be the dominant partner. A sly enforcement of classism and social status. This likely meant freeborn Roman men engaging with plebeians, slaves, and freed persons. Yet, this assured enforcement of a dominant role meant women were essentially banned from having open same sex relationships. In ancient Rome's strictly gendered society, a dominant role, for a woman, was entirely frowned upon. 
ancient Rome, a long, long time before Cindy Lauper. Lovemaking, or the deed as the Stoics knew it, was a readily accepted part of Roman society, so much so that prostitution was readily accepted. Sex workers in ancient Rome were most commonly either freed women or slaves. Though that isn't to say there weren't freeborn courtesans available for the high-paying Roman patricians. The place of eros and sexuality in Roman society was entirely cemented under the reign of Emperor Augustus. In 40 CE, the heir to Caesar started official taxation of prostitution, solidifying it as legitimate in Roman society. As if that wasn't condoning enough, Augustus legislated against any penalties befalling sex workers for their profession. Debauched emperors? Progressive policy. Who would have guessed? Despite there being a lot of sexual freedom for men in Roman society, there was a moral code alongside this to ensure that excess wasn't abound. Well, maybe more excess. Excess of ex- Ah, forget it. In a world where extramarital affairs were accepted, standard practice, and men could openly frequent brothels, the code, mos maiorum, was for men to adhere to. It meant that self-control was viewed as a defining trait of masculinity, and excess was something entirely frowned upon. Should this code and that handful of laws protecting Rome's free citizens be broken, the death penalty was the liable outcome. Incestum was a crime that didn't just apply to family members, but also those under a vow of celibacy. That was punishable by the death penalty. It may come as no surprise that rape was also among the acts punishable by death. A disturbing and shocking trait of Roman love by modern eyes is its practice of pederasty. Taking on the traditions of the ancient Greeks, mos gracorum, could refer to Roman men pursuing sexual relationships with pubescent and adolescent boys. Under the perspective of accepted homosexuality, pedophilia was accepted if it fulfilled the correct societal criteria. A freeborn Roman man could have such a relationship if they maintained their Romanness and their masculinity. This meant they would be the dominant, penetrating partner, and the minor in question was non-Roman and typically a slave. There really is no positive or humor to be found in this. There is only to mention Lex Scanthinia, a law that protected free-born Roman boys from the practice. Well, there's that, I suppose. Think marrying at the highest level means you've made it in ancient Rome? Think again! Unfortunately for anyone who believed such a thing, Roman emperors had their own list of problems. The debauched and deviant Roman Empire is most famously depicted in Caligula's reign, which included sleeping with other men's wives and, uh, mm, relatives. Ew. However, ancient Rome had more than one emperor who was capable of depravity. Look no further than Nero. Having murdered his pregnant wife, Nero decided the best way to remedy this self-created hole in his life was to marry a man who looked like his deceased wife and order him to be castrated. Oh, come on! True story, in this amazing tale, not only was the look-alike turned eunuch, Nero demanded he was dressed in his late wife's clothes. Man, there must have been some easier way to marry an emperor. Out of all the things the Romans brought to love, marriage and lovemaking, a considerable feat is their founding of Valentine's Day. Well, kinda. One of ancient Rome's pastoral festivals was Lupercalia, a festival that was believed to cleanse its city and promote its participants' fertility. The festival would typically take place from the 13th to the 15th of February. By most accounts, Lupercalia was a heightened mass of drinking and heightened senses. Both a dog and a goat would be sacrificed, then their hides would be carved to whip attending women with. It was a held belief doing so would increase their chances of childbearing. Among its rituals was men drawing names of attending women from a jar. The matched couple would then conduct business across the festival. Let's get down, let's get down to business. And quite possibly beyond. The name itself, Valentine's Day, we can thank Emperor Claudius II for. Across the third century, on two occasions, the emperor executed two men named Valentine on February 14th. There you go, a bit of murder, animal sacrifice, and wanton sex, and it's bad Hallmark cards till the end of time. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.